12 last week. Wow. Well, the need is great. God's provided, provided. Found what? Wow. Wow. Price of gas. Yeah, that's really Chandler and Kenton. That's what I asked her. I said, with the price of gas, is this really worth it? She said, in this case, yes. Wow. So well, I well, asked Dale one day how it works. That was the girl from Peoria. Well, you know, it's interesting that that actually kind of fits in with some of First Peter 4. But, uh, you know. As, as Peter said, or Paul said too, you know, if if God's given you a gift, use it to to help, help the body. And wow. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm trying to remember which state I'm in today. Mostly the state of confusion. <laughs> I don't feel like I've been here and 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 helping very much. Definitely been missing my family here. Let's go ahead and start with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your your provision, for the safety that you've given us as we travel, for the protection. Thank you for just so many things that you have given us. Thank you for uh, continuing to provide in the food bank the ability to minister to people's needs in these rough times, these dire times. Um, it is humbling to watch you work through us. Thank you for that. I ask you would bless today as we <coughs> look into First Peter 4. And I ask that you would uh, use me, help me to be extremely accurate to what you would have me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as way of review, looking at 1 Peter 1 through 3, Peter began by addressing himself to the believers who are scattered throughout five countries outside their homeland of Israel. He is instructing them as to proper behavior as Christians who are living among the Gentiles, so the Gentiles will be influenced favorably for the cause of Christ and ultimately unto salvation. After the greeting, he reminds them of the future inheritance they have provided by the Father, of the future salvation they have in Christ, and of the revelation of that, uh, excuse me, of that salvation by the prophets that were given in Old Testament times. Because of this, they are to be holy in their conduct because the God who saved them is a holy God. That salvation and redemption was not with physical, earthly wealth, like silver or gold, but rather by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and that Christ, as well as the message he delivered, endures forever. Since this is true, then as a believer, having laid aside all wickedness, deceit, hypocrisies, envies, speaking up down upon others in order to put them down, you are to desire the sincere, unadulterated word of God in order that you may grow through it. Christians are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, in order that we might show forth the virtues of Christ who saved us. <clears throat> in order to do that well, we are to abstain from fleshly lusts have a good conduct before the unsaved so that they might be saved, submit ourselves to governing authorities, honor all men, highly value the brotherhood, have a reverence for God, and honor the king. All household servants are to submit to their masters and count it as admirable before God if they suffer 
for doing the right thing. They are also to recognize that we are all saved to suffer as Christ did. Wives are admonished in the same way to submit to their husbands and to adorn themselves modestly. Husbands are to live with their wives according to the knowledge of the word of God and give honor to their wives as joint heirs of the grace of God. All believers are to sympathize with one another, delight in one another, be tender-hearted toward one another, and be friendly toward one another. All believers are also to never render evil for evil, railing for railing to anyone, but we are to speak well of one another and if, even of those who abuse us. We are therefore to be prepared to defend the faith to those who ask us a reason for the hope that is within us and be prepared to suffer for Christ since he suffered for us. That's a lot packed into ch three chapters. Let's start looking at chapter four. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them to, in, to the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Excuse me. For the gospel has, been, has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. I'm going to stop there. As I really worked through this, I came to a whole different understanding of, of what some of what this is saying. Um, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, that, uh, that phrase has suffered it implies suffering over someone there's there's a, a word in there that literally should be translated over so the idea is christ suffered over us and it's it's kind of interesting as that starts l layering mo the understanding uh since christ has suffered over us arm yourselves also with the same purpose the same mind attitude uh, of being willing to suffer and by the way this this concept of the mind of Christ is very clearly stated in uh, the book of Philippians and uh, in Philippians Paul flat out said let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and it talks about his humble humility and, and that willingness to suffer and, and that whole concept. And Peter's kind of doing that right here. He's saying, um, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. The word arm has in mind, uh, in many other places in Scripture, we see the word watch used. And it has in mind the idea of standing guard. So it's it, in, in more modern vernacular, we might say, Take up arms in preparation for this thing, okay? Except what we're taking up isn't like a sword. It's, it's this idea of, of the mind, think, uh, mind attitude and thinking of humility and being willing to suffer like Christ did, okay? Uh, we, don't, we don't think of that as arming ourselves. Yes, Uh -huh. To me, it, it would seem like that would also address his concern for us, his care for us, and that it also would be... Absolutely, absolutely. 
And, and the, that's why I think it's so important to bring out that it was never really translated. It talks about Christ suffering in the flesh, but the, so much of that really carries the understanding in most people's minds thinking about the cross and, the, and, and that whole crucifixion trial, illegal though it was, and, and all the things he suffered through in that. But there's, it's too easy to overlook the spiritual as, and, and, the, and the emotional agony and, and some of those kinds of things that went on at the same time. And this, by missing that word, it's trying to draw all of that into, into Peter's perspective. And it, and it really did begin to profoundly change how I understood this passage. I had a, it isn't like I had a wrong perspective earlier, but it was a much, much shallower one than, than what I realized as I looked at this. Um, so since Christ has suffered over us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, the same mind thinking or attitude to be willing to suffer as Christ did. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Very misquoted. Very misunderstood, very misquoted. So, uh, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased, has been released from. By the way, it's perfect passive. Perfect meaning it it's starts because of an antecedent condition and it continues on without cessation. But it's passive, that means it happens to you. You do not do it. It's not active, it's passive, okay? Um, so, it has ceased from sin. That word sin is actually a singular. It isn't sins. It isn't sin as a plural sin in, in involving all of our sin, our sinfulness. It isn't talking about that. And this is where it gets misquoted many times. There are sects of people who call themselves Christians, and I am not here to judge whether that's between them and God. Okay, but when you start naming the name of Christ, you start being accountable for what you say. And they will say that Peter and John, and this is one of the passages they try and use as proof text, that, well, when, when you're a godly Christian, you don't sin anymore. And that is just absolutely wrong. Throughout the book of Romans, in, in Paul's dissertation about our sinful condition, and here, where it uses the word sin in a singular word, it's literally, and, and in Romans, Paul actually wrote it. Here, it's implied. Because he's using the word sin, it's the sin. The antecedent uh, definite article, the, is used in Paul's writings in almost every single occurrence of the use of the word sin in the book of Romans. It's an amazing study because now all of a sudden we're talking about, and Lucy, you can, you can grab this because of your grasp of grammar very, very solidly. When you say a noun, in this case, sin, it's implied that it could be a sin. It could be just any one. But when you precede it by the definite article, the, now you are stating that there is a specific, definite, particular sin. Am I correct? Okay. So when Paul comes through Romans and he says, the sin, he is not leaving it open to, to sinfulness. He is, he is referring to a particular sin. And that sin was the sin in the Garden of Eden from which m mankind fell or through which mankind fell. That is the, pr the, that is the context that he's referring to, okay? And when you look at that and, and you start saying, famous one, for the wages of the sin is death. It is because of the fall and the inherited sinful nature that came out of the, of, out of the Adamic nature back in the Garden of Eden, that is why, why we are dead spiritually in our trespasses and the sin. You see? And Peter carries the same thing forward here 
He who has suffered in the flesh has been released from the sin. Paul makes the statement over and over again that, that because of the work of finished work of Christ, when we accept that, we are no longer slaves to the sin. Peter's saying the same thing. Okay? It does not mean that I have overcome my sinful nature and I will never sin. That is absolutely biblically incorrect. In fact, I would dare to say it approaches heresy. And that's a very strong word. It is not that we will not sin. It's that we are released from the bondage to the Adamic nature sin that occurred in the Garden of Eden. That's what Peter's saying here, okay? By the way, if you want to cross-reference that with some of, of Paul's uh, writings, uh, specifically it would cross-reference to Romans 6, verses 6 and 7. Anyway, arm yourselves with the same mind thinking or attitude as Christ uh, uh, being willing to suffer because he who has suffered in the flesh has been released from the sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men but for the will of God. Do you see how that fits? If you are no longer a slave, a, bo a, a bond slave to the sin because you have been washed in Christ's blood, you've accepted his finished work, you are redeemed, regenerated, all of these uh, uh, adjectives that we use to describe this. If you have come to that, you are no longer in bondage to fulfill these, these things that we look out in the world and we can see just fine. Okay? And throughout history, that has been the track of mankind. Mankind is not getting better. Okay? So once you have been saved, you are no longer bound to that as a slave, so you can then begin with the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome those sinful things in your life because you're no longer chained to that to that original sin okay verse 3 for the time is uh, the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the gentiles having pursued a course of sensuality lusts drunkenness carousing dr uh, drinking parties and abominable idolatries the life you lived up to the point where Christ got hold of you and you came to understand the gospel message was enough. Anyone who wants to say, and there are those who play off the hedonistic stuff and say, well, I got to check out the sin. I got I to gotta understand that so that I can turn away from it. That is not how sin works. That is not how sinful nature works. And it is not what Scripture teaches. Peter here is saying, whatever sinfulness you did in your life prior to Christ getting hold of you because you were bound and chained to that sin, you have been released from, and, it, and, and what you did was bad enough and it was sufficient. And then he goes, uh, having pursued a course of sensuality, Lusts, that's passions and desires. Drunkenness, and that implies habitual drunkenness. Uh, carousing, this boisterous and drunken festivities. Drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Idolatry, by the way, is defined throughout Scripture as anything that you put above God. Now, in the Old Testament, we often see, and quite frankly, in some religions even today, we see physical idols that represent what they perceive as, as deity in their life. However, anything we value more than God 
is an idol to us. And boy, we could go right down the list in our modern world. You know, we've got money, we've got job, we've got, we've got play, we've got this, we've got that. Anything we make more important than our time with God is an idol to us. It might even be something we're using for God. That doesn't mean it isn't an idol to us. Maybe you have a skill that you use in the church. Okay, but how is it being used? If it's being used for self-glorification at the same time that it's being used to edify the body, it's an idol. Verse 4. In all this, in everything we've covered up to this point, they, the, the unsaved people that are watching you, are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you. Oh, so you're not good enough to go out drinking with us tonight? You're, you're fill in the blank. Oh, oh, you're one of those goody two-shoes holier-than-thou people, huh? Uh, we've all heard it. We all understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, no. They don't understand that Christians can have a wonderful, good, clean fun without going into that. The word dissipation has in mind this idea of wastefulness. Okay? Why spend why, why spend $15 when you can spend 30 Or this, this whole, I, I'm being a little sarcastic with that, but this whole idea of, of just not applying biblical stewardship principles and instead having applying it all towards having fun according to their de de their definition and they're looking at you and going what's wrong with you a stick in the mud what's going on with that first No, 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 and I'm not at all saying that. And you know how to go with them and be a good example, too, sometimes, you know. Okay, okay, but make sure that the... I get what you're saying. But, but let's, let's make sure that the context of what they're sure. doing and where they're going does not get taken as condoning it sure. and participating with it on a lesser scale because that dilutes our... We, we are to be holy, that we are to be in the world but not of the world, and I could go on and on with that. But I get your point too. There's a point at which you become so segregated. That you're losing any opportunity for influence on anybody also. The, the old saying that you can become so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. However, with all of that, as they come to this point of you won't participate in their excesses, their sinfulness, and their dissipation. You won't condone it because you choose to separate yourself from that. And they malign you for it. Verse 5, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Um, the word living is a plural word, so is the dead. So it's the living ones and the dead ones. I've mentioned before that when you look at the New Testament, the word dead, there are a couple different words for it. Uh, and it's really helpful for us to understand which word is being used here in order to fully understand what's being said. And they will give account, the unsaved who are maligning Christians for not being willing to do those things that they ought not do, will be held accountable to him who is ready to judge the living ones and the inoperative or inactive ones. It's the word nec uh, necrus here, okay? 
That's verses 1 through 5. Now I'm going to jump into verse 6 here. If I can get at least through verse 11, it would be really nice. Wow. Wow. Oh, come on. I've got another 15 minutes. (laughs) For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is, actually I read that, didn't I? But I haven't broken it out. For the, the gospel, the good news, that Christ died, was buried, rose again the third day, and therefore paid the penalty, has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead. Again, root word necros, inoperative or inactive ones, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live and continue to live, present tense verb, in the spirit according to the will of God, the will of. Notice in your Bible, it should be in italics. It was added. It's not according to the will of God. It's according to God. 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 Yours is according to God. What version do you have? NIV. NIV? Okay. All right. Uh, In in, uh, a number of translations, it says according to the will of God and uh, the will of God should be in italics, which means the translators added it, thinking that they're making it more readable. But the issue is sometimes sometimes it changes the nuance of what's being said. It's according to to God. Say that again. Where does the NIV put in the word now? Um, verse 6. This is the reason gospel is preached even to those who are now dead. Oh, yeah. See, that's... that's. Uh, there it is in now. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe the King James Version, and I don't believe the uh, NASB even translate the word as now. That's one of those italicized words that shouldn't be there. And I, I wasn't aware that NIV did that. Then it says there, that there is no such word. Not, it, I agree. It's, it's not there. And when it talks about dead here, um, there are a couple of things that can be taken into view. And I honestly haven't quite chewed through it enough to be sure how I want to take that. It could be the idea of those who are now dead, those who have died. That they had to be preached to before they died. Well, now hold on a moment. Remember our time context here. Because there's a caveat to that statement. That that is certainly absolutely true today. Okay? But there was one time period when that was not completely true. And that is the crucifixion. There are a couple of references in Scripture where it talks about Christ descending to the lower parts of the earth and preaching to those. And usually the understanding is that he went to, from an Old Testament perspective, Old Testament saints is what we would think of, Abraham's bosom, and preached the gospel to those so that they understood and had a completed understanding of it and then took them out of Abraham's bosom. Okay. Isn't the idea of that, though, is that these Old Testament saints believed in the concept that God gave them, what Jesus did was said, hey, you you know that concept you believed in? That's me. Right. Exactly. Okay, so it wasn't like he was converting them. It's more like he was completing their understanding. Okay. There is another school of thought out there that, quite frankly... I'm not sure I agree with, but I cannot empirically prove it from Scripture. Therefore, I cannot ultimately reject it. And when I get to heaven, I'll know. 
okay? And, and I got to kind of leave it there, but I want to explain it because it, 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 it falls into line here in the discussion. When, it, when, those, when scriptures talk about Christ during those three days descending into the bowels of the earth, which we would look at as Old, as Old Testament Hades or Sheol, depending on whether you're looking at the Greek or the Hebrew. And we understand from a number of, of scripture passages throughout, throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament, that there were two halves to that. We even see that in early in the New Testament in Christ's ministry when he gave us the, the uh, parable of, of Lazarus. Okay. One of the th things that, is a biblical possibility is that Christ understood Abraham's bosom, that they were saved, that they were just Old Testament saints. So it was simply bringing them up to understanding. It is possible that he actually went to the torture side of it. Most of those people did not know who God was. And so it is possible that he actually preached the gospel to those so that those who, when they heard it, realized what, what it was. They might have been converted at that point. I don't know. Scripture does not say this is theorizing. I just want you to understand there are actually kind of two schools of thought there about whether he went to all of Hades or just to Abraham's bosom or simply possibly to the torture side, the torment side of Hades. And it says, he, it does say that he led captives free. Probably. And I would agree that that's, Abraham's bosom was, was the, was the, uh, the uh, again, when you get into Old Testament Sheol or, or Greek word Hades, there were two halves to it, and, and we see from the parable of, of Lazarus that there was a great gulf fixed so that those who were on one side could not go to the other. So, so the rich man couldn't, couldn't get Lazarus to dip his finger in water and, and cool his tongue or any of that because there's this great gulf and they can't cross back and forth. Okay, But, but Old Testament saints, those who... who Abraham is what's why they part of why they call it Abraham's bosom. Abraham, he was justified by faith. Those who were in an Old Testament context prior to the crucifixion were justified by their faith that God would save them because of their of their faith in him, not because of their obedience, okay? And those when they died went to the pleasant side of 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 Hades but it was kind of this holding. He, they did not go to heaven. Okay. At some point they did, and I do believe Scripture teaches us that that was when Christ uh, was crucified, that three days he was dead, somewhere in that time frame. It's not broken out beyond that. So now we start saying, well, this is my guess, that's your guess. I don't know. Okay, and we don't even actually know which side of Hades he went to. There are different, different beliefs in different ways, and I'm saying I lean towards Abraham's bosom, quite frankly, personally, but I cannot use the Bible to say no because of this passage. It was absolutely this side or that side. I can't do that, and I won't. Patty? No, they were not. They were going to Sheol, and it was almost, almost a, a. They were obviously aware, but it was a, it was a state. Yeah, it was kind of a stasis. They were in limbo, and and they were waiting. Okay. However, we do see from a number of passages, including that that parable of last. By the way, I don't think that was a parable, but that's beside the point. I think it was a statement of a, an actual story. However. Lazarus and the rich man, we see that there were there was a, a place of pleasure and pleasantness and there was a place of torments plural. Okay. And it was obviously a very horrible place and it was roughly analogous to hell, which by the way is not the final and ultimate thing. 
we see in Revelation that hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. So our ult the ultimate death of a person who rejects Christ is not hell. It is the lake of fire. Okay. Anyway. Wow. I just went way off, way off track there. But it, that, well, good. Then, then, then it was not a, a moment of waste of time, Lucy. It wasn't. Okay. Um, verse. Well, yeah, and everybody wants to say go, go to heaven, go to heaven. Well, that's certainly a post-crucifixion reality. Okay, but prior to that, that is not where they went. Um, Right. Now, that does not mean that there were not those who were not raised back to the rest of their life. We have we have Lazarus. We have uh, the uh, the widow's son back at, with Elijah. There are a few people who were resurrected, but then they lived out their the rest of their natural life and died again. And and Christ was the first to be resurrected, perfected body. Done. Okay. Except that always left me the question is what happened to Elijah and um, the son of Adam? Oh, um, who walked with God and then was not with the disciples. Enoch. Okay. Enoch, yeah. And, and th those are the two people who did not die physically. So they're, again, now we're, now we're getting a conjecture, but there is a conjecture that that the two witnesses who are sent from God in, in Revelation may very well be Enoch and Elijah. We don't know. It doesn't say. It's pointless to debate that. Okay. Anyway. No, no, no. These are some of the things that make these Bible studies funny as you begin to, not funny, fun, because now you start taking th things for, and you start knitting it together and seeing this, Beautiful embroidery throughout Scripture. It's amazing. Well, it's nice that we're able to ask things we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not, not being pointed at that we we don't know. And at some point, I'm. We should know what we don't. And you keep getting smarter on me, Lucy. You're going to ask a question, and I'm going to have to start saying, "I don't know." Okay, she could do that. Um, so, uh, let me get back to verse six cause we, uh, we bunny trailed and used some time. That's okay. I'll tell you right now. I'm not going to get, get through verse 11. Um, but I do want to finish up verse six. I want to point out a few things here. Okay. I, I, I mentioned that, that, uh, there are those who think that this may refer to Christ preaching to those dead ones who who were in Hades, and I don't think that that's actually the context, but because it's sometimes taken that way, I wanted to bring it up, okay? Um, it says that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the Spirit according to God. Those are all present tense statements, and there's no reason for them to be judged as men if they've already died, it doesn't make sense. So I, I believe that the context really is talking about those who grasp the gospel message, accept it, and become Christians. And at that point, even though they're judged as men and therefore judged by what we can see externally, and by the way, the context is Christians being maligned, right? Because we, we stand aside of some things. Nevertheless, they may live in the spirit according to God. So could this be talking about those people who were maligning them, judging them in the flesh? Well, it could be. Or sure. it could also maybe be talking about how you are um, judged or what you have done. There's still consequences even when you're dead. 
And I think all of that carries carries into this into this context, certainly. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can get through at least verse seven because it kind of ties a bunch of this together, even though most people don't take it that way. It says, "The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit." For the purpose of prayer. It's talking about being maligned, suffering for Christ, being holy and separated, and therefore, because of taking those stands, being maligned, all that kind of stuff. And it says, the end of all things is near. That word near, the particular word that's used, carries the idea of starting at a point in time and continuing to draw nearer and nearer. It, it ties into to my discussion previously about the word to and unto, where to is where you've arrived at something, but unto means it's in motion toward. So this is the idea of in motion toward. The end of all things is drawing nearer. Therefore, because the end is drawing nearer, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. That word prayer is actually prayers, plural. So it's this idea of being self-controlled in mind and emotion for the purpose of prayers. To state that another way, we are to be sober-minded, thinking clearly about things, putting things in proper perspective, and always being prayerful. Okay? That's the idea of things being, being carried through in, in verse 7. And it does take the first six verses and it kind of kind of ties it up into a package. Yes, Patty. Take it to God. Take it to God. Take it to God. Whether it be for yourself, for others, we're told a lot of things about prayer and how it should be. Uh, were you going to say something? Mm-hmm. Okay, so for the most part, you want to name a couple of examples of people that did suffer death, that it looked like they arose to heaven. But then you go to the end of the Bible in Revelation, where it says, it, or the end of the world, where it says, those who are dead in Christ, because technically everybody before Jesus rose from the dead somewhere other than heaven. True. So all those people, even though they were righteous and they mm-hmm. walked with God and talked with God and communicated, and they may not have used the word God or Jesus, but they knew that there was something out there, uh, something bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. But they still died a, a, de- a human death. And then in Revelation, they were, they were in Christ then in the end, then those who are dead in Christ will rise. So, so until Revelation, nobody is saved after death. Once since died, since, since the crucifixion, and since that completed yeah. work, you have to accept in this life, because once you f- separate from the body, and this is where it gets into that word dead, and which word is being used, is it necros or thanatos? Okay. okay. Um, once that happened, one significant thing changed, and that is that you would never again be allowed to change your mind and say, oh, right. this eternity thing's real. I better accept Christ. Can't do that. Okay, when you die on this earth and your spirit is separated from your body, the state you, are, you died in is your eternal state. You have now to be judged and eventually either allowed into heaven because you accepted Christ's finished work or you will ultimately be in the lake of fire. As, and, and see, understand that the revelation says that the lake of fire is the second death. That d- word death is the word thanatos, separation. The punishment is separation in eternity, uh, in, in the totality of eternity from God. 
with no hope of a changed condition. Right. Okay. And, and again, quoting Revelation, it says, this is the second death. Okay. So, so the, the word dead, me carrying those two different things, um, a man who mentored me made the great analogy very quickly, and then I'll shut it down. Um, if I were to come up, be standing up here and get all excited and, and suddenly have a massive heart attack and fall down dead, okay, my body falls down on the, on the floor here and becomes necros. It becomes inactive because my spirit, Thanatos, separates from my body. Because that's the real me anyway. This is just an old mud ball. Yeah, okay. okay. Short, fat, ugly one, but okay. I'll go with that. That is absolutely correct. Their eternal state is set. The only thing that needs to happen is that God ch at, at some point in the future will, will judge them for what they did or did not do. And ultimately they're separated because they did not accept his, his, his plan. Okay, We're over. I need to shut it down. I'm getting the look back there. <laughs> So let's go ahead and close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. It, it, it's, it's a joy to come into your house, spend time with your body here locally, and just, just have good discussion and talk about the things that you've revealed in your scriptures. Thank you for that. I ask that you would bless the time here, bless the discussion. In Jesus' name, amen.